In this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, we are going to get together with a professional trainer and talk about training. Now, when we started to lay this show out, we thought we were going to talk about e-collar training and really focus on the use of e-collars. And uh, our trainer quickly made us realize that there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you ever think about using an e-collar in your training. So we brought Jared Moss of Best Gun Dogs into this episode so that we can start talking about foundation training first. This is going to be the first part of a series of regular podcasts we're going to do with Jared to uh, expand our knowledge on training these hounds. We're missing a lot when we don't start out our puppies in the right way. So Jared is a professional trainer and we searched the world over to bring you the highest quality trainer we could find, but also someone who is a houndsman. He's not only a professional gun dog trainer, but he is also a Utah houndsman. And Jared has made his living training gun dogs, and then he has used those skills and moved them over into his his uh, hound sports as well. So I think this will be a really interesting topic and really expand our knowledge on how to get these puppies started off on the right foot so that they can become accomplished big game hounds coon hounds every dog is going to benefit and every every dog trainer will benefit from this episode so sit back and get ready for that welcome to the houndsman xp podcast and this week we go to the state of utah the beehive state now, our guest is is from Utah, and Steve, I've got some facts for Utah that you may be interested in. Do you know what the state food is for Utah? The state food, the state I would food. think, I would think the uh, the state drink would be Hawaiian Punch for the uh, Osmond family. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> The only thing I know about Utah is I went to the Polynesian Cultural Center in Honolulu, and they served us Hawaiian punch, and that that is run by the Mormon Church. So that's kind of the association that I have with Utah. And I, uh, beyond that, not nah, I'm I'm ignorant. Well, this is going to be interesting. Like me. Uh, this is going to be interesting for you because this has got to be staple. A staple food in a retirement community. It's Jello. All right. Yep. It's Jello, and um, uh, it's actually green Jello is is what I'm coming up with on my end. So I figure down there in the retirement community, that's like that's like a uh, cover charge for every every uh, card game is a Jello mold, right? Oh, I imagine. And green is the, the color of choice. Uh, that reminds me of my friend Bubba back in West Virginia. You know, he and uh, Mary Florine, his wife had twins, and they named them Orangelo and Lamangelo. And that's spelled L-E-M-O-N-J-E-L-L-O and O-R-A-N-G-E-J-E-L-L-O. So... <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, the Jello thing. I hadn't yeah. thought about that in a while. Yeah, so the it's the Utah, uh, the Beehive State, of course, and uh, Utah was named after the Ute Indians, which men, means people of the mountains. So not to be confused with the uh, my cousin Vinny, Utes. <laughs> Do you think there's anybody old enough listening to this podcast that remembers that great movie? I don't know, but we got to bring with some, Joe Patchy. Patchy. We, we have to bring some refinement into our sport. So, <laughs> you know, we're challenging people to go out there and, and watch plenty of episodes of uh, uh, Andy Griffith, My Cousin Vinny, all those classic movies. But our our guest today is Jared Moss of Best gun dogs kennel and podcast jared how are you today i'm great guys thanks for having me oh you're welcome you're welcome chris i noticed that jared didn't laugh at any of our jokes so we're gonna have to I up was, our I was, game i was laughing in my i was laughing in my head but i didn't want to 
to laugh too loud because we get a lot of the Jello comments out here. You know, when you have you have five kids or six kids, you got to feed them somehow. So <laughs> Jello goes Jello's cheap and it goes a long way. <laughs> I it, like Jello. I'll go on record. I like it. So is is Jello really that big of a big of a an, a deal out there? No, it's it's just a gag. I mean, I think it was in the seventies and eighties, but I don't think anybody drinks. <laughs> I haven't ate Jello at our house for a long, long, long time. Yeah. What's your favorite favorite flavor, Jared? <laughs> um, my mom used to make more of a like a red Jello, like a strawberry or a raspberry. Mm-hmm. One of the berries were always good, and then if you put enough. Uh, whip topping on it it didn't matter what the flavor was it yeah. just tasted like sugar <laughs> how can you go wrong how can you go wrong right sugar yep. on top of sugar <laughs> well we're here to talk to you today because uh jared is a professional bird dog trainer also a houndsman and uh, we're going to talk about e-collar stuff today we're going to talk about e-collar training and try to uh, get some more information out there for people that are using e-collars in their training programs. Maybe uh, bring some information to, uh, what am I looking for here, Steve? I don't want to say broaden the horizons, but but, um, expand our knowledge maybe on the proper use of e-collars. Well, I think uh, that's probably it, Chris. Uh, I can't think of a single training aid that's more important, nor can I think of one that's more misused than the e-collar. You hear all the horror stories, um, you know, the little uh, quotes that I've heard over the years, you know, I fried his ears, you know, and uh, all of these kind of things that people um, miss uh, apparently there's a lot of misuse well of I, can, I can i can tell you i've fallen into that category myself you know uh, going back to the days of the early tritronic system uh, with the expandable metal antenna i mean that thing whipped out there to four feet three or four feet and uh, there was there was one mode and that was down when you're pressing that button down and and trying to run as much of electricity through that dog as you could to stop any unwanted behavior. And most of the time what ended up happening was instead of correcting or teaching the dog anything, the dog would come back in beside me. And then I'm frustrated because the dog won't hunt. So what do I do? I try to shock him to get to go hunting. And talk about a complete <laughs> misuse uh, of of a valuable training tool like that and that's why i thought it would be so much fun informative uh, for our listeners and us to learn from a person who is an expert in this field with e-collars and jared we can't appreciate uh, tell you how much we appreciate you coming on the podcast and and sharing your knowledge and experience with us tell us a little bit about your experience and where you're from um and your best dog's best gun dogs kennel out there that you're running sure i i uh, grew up in southern utah and uh started i I grew up fishing and and hunting mule deer a lot as a young young boy until i was about 10 or so and then um just i had a passion for hunting and being out in the field with my dad and my brothers and we started quail hunting started hunting those desert birds to just expand our opportunities to be outside more and um, quickly learned that those little guys could hang out in the cactus and the tamaracks and we needed a better tool than just us kicking the brush to get them. And so we got a, I got my first, I had an uncle that had bird dogs and uh, Mr. Dale Osborne brought down one of his bird dogs. And the first time he came down, she hadn't hunted those, those desert birds very much, but she helped us retrieve anything that we shot. And then she did, start picking up towards the end of the day, start picking up, you know, where they were at. And, and, uh, she, she didn't point a ton of them because the setting conditions are very difficult. I mean, you go from pheasants to quail, it's a big difference, but the light bulb came on for me. It was like, Oh, okay. I got to have a dog. So I got my first dog when I was 15 and, um, just started reading every book I could get the pointing dog journal had a club down there that I was affiliated with and got, 
really fortunate. I had two mentors down there that helped me understand, you know, this is how you communicate with a dog and this is how you teach him to heal and hear. And those guys spent a lot of Saturday mornings helping me and uh, kind of helped me cut the learning curve out. So from that point on, it was just go, go, go. I mean, and, and ever since that's been my passion. Um, you know, I'd jump in there real quick. I can still remember. Uh, just jump in. You, sure. you said something there that I think is key. Uh, most of the successful houndsmen that I know have taken advantage of someone who is willing to mentor them. Uh, somebody who is willing to accept advice from a mentor. And that is so important for for us as older houndsmen to recognize that if we're going to bring people into this sport, it's not, not just sending them a puppy and saying good luck. You know, it's it's actual mentoring some of these younger hunters. And I, I know Steve has, has done a lot of work in that arena with youth programs and stuff. Steve, what kind of – can you add to that at all? Well, Chris, certainly, you know, one of the joys of being an older person as I am – is getting to talk to younger people that are eager to learn about something that means a lot to me. I think we older hunters, or, or even those that may not be so old, like Jared, but those with lots of experience, are always willing to share. You know, if we if we enjoy something and love something, we want to share it with with everybody we can, and. Uh, the frustration comes sometimes with finding willing ears to listen and willing hands to do the work that we show them how to do. And um, mentoring young hunters, I know we we started a thing when I was with the AKC called Coonhound U for university. And uh, the idea was to get the clubs involved in programs and the other registries have done this as well and uh, uh, there's just no uh, getting around it if we want to pass this sport along we we're going to have to teach it but we're going to have to seek out those individuals that want to learn and uh, uh, that's you know I could talk a long time about that subject but but working with the youth and 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 passing on you know, uh, the heritage is so vitally important. Well, Jared, I didn't mean to take us down a rabbit path, but when you mentioned that, you know, it's so important in the fact that you're willing to take that advice and then put it into a professional career. I don't know what else, what else we could ask for out of a youth than that. How many years ago was that? Uh, it'll be 23 years. 23. About 23 years right now. Mm-hmm. Those two men are still are still my mentors today. I love them. I talk to them often. Um, they're like a father figure, and it's just it's it's you know I, mm-hmm. I get a little bit emotional thinking about it because <laughs> I can call them at any time and say, "Hey man, you know, what do you uh, what do you think about this? What about that?" And they all laugh now and say, "Well, you've surpassed us in your knowledge," but. Uh, you know, it, it's not just hunting, it's also life. It's uh, it's really neat to have those guys a part of my life. Awesome. We could just awesome. it, end the podcast with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, we a- could, but let's don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been very fortunate to find other mentors in the training world. You know, I, I worked with Dave Walker, who had, at the time that he was doing the seminars for us, he was... 80, 81 or 82 years old. I mean, he'd been training bird dogs for 53 years. And I had the opportunity to spend days with him in the field. And it was just watching him work a dog was like just filling up your cup, man. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't scoop it fast enough because it was just his, his mannerisms, the way he walked, the way he, his body language. I mean, it was things that I didn't learn in a book or couldn't learn in a book or the videos was being, uh, you know, in direct contact with him, standing there with him, watching him do that. That was, you know, that that took us from amateur to pro very, very fast. 
Wow. What about some of the things you've done professionally, Jared? I mean, I know that you're uh, obviously not one that wants to brag about his accomplishments, but tell us a little bit about this career that you've had with dogs, your professional career, and and what what are some of the things maybe that you're most proud of. Um, kind of fast. Okay, if, we, if we go back in that story, when I was 16, I was I had a pair of dogs. Got my second dog really fast after the first one. And I was 16, 17 years old. I had a Toyota pickup, a job, and all I did was hunt and train. I trained my dogs every day for, you know, <laughs> probably too much time then. Then I enjoyed it so much it was an hour or two session every day. But it was fun because I got to the level where I would show up in my little rusted Toyota pickup, and my dad would go with me a lot. And I, and, I, and I appreciate that. He was always there to support me. And we would go to these, they called them fun hunts, kind of like a, uh, I, and I don't know what the equivalent would be in, just like a, a fun coon hunt, you know, it was for mm-hmm. fun. It wasn't, it was to see who could point the most birds and retrieve the most birds and do it with style and class and you had to handle your dog. Anyway, I would show up as a 16-year-old boy with those two dogs and all the men out there were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and they'd look at me like, Who, who's this young guy? And then I would come out there, and we would just smoke him. And <laughs> that nobody... So that, that to me, you know, was just a blast. And then we met, we went to AKC hunt tests and did a lot of that. And the club that I was with, those two gentlemen, those mentors, took me to those clubs and showed me how to get through the, you know, how to handle your dog and train them to those levels of senior hunter and master hunter and, I think my biggest regret is I had one dog that was one pass away from his master title, uh, but I didn't finish it. I actually went on a two-year mission uh, from a church, and when I got back, life just happened, and I never did finish his master hunt title, but we titled several dogs and competed all over, and unfortunately, those those hunt tests out here in the West have become scarce to none. It's, it's really hard to to continue that game and so we molded our business that stem dogs developed off of creating a companion hunting dog and it really boiled down to i had a lot of uh gentlemen that would come to me and say hey i'm trying to get my 10 year old or my 13 year old son out in the field and i want to hunt with them and i don't know how to train this dog and i went to a pheasant preserve or i went hunting with this guy once and we got this pup, but we're just frustrated. We can't, we can't get him to do anything. And, and uh, I really wanted those guys to be successful with their, with their young, you know, uh, children and their boys getting in the field. And I was like, we got to figure out a way to start helping these guys. And that's where the training developed was really from that need of, yeah, I, there's some big gaps I left in there, but I think in the nutshell, mm-hmm. it's all about getting, more boys out in the field and, and having a great time with their dad. Or, you know, a lot of, I, we, we helped a lot, we help a lot of youth events where we have uh, single mothers come and bring their sons to these youth hunts. And some of these kids have never even held a gun. And we do a crash course in safety and we do a crash course on clay pigeons. And then we're out, you know, two hours later out there hunting with those guys. But we're able to do that because of the pointing dog scenario where I, my dogs are trained to a level that they will point the bird and not move. And then I can help the young man be successful. Okay. Let's get you positioned, right? Let's get you safe. You know, let's click yeah. off that safety now and the bird will flush. And, and for them, it's a, it's a huge experience. So. Of course it Got is. Got off on a tangent there. <laughs> no, no, that's yeah. awesome. <clears throat> that, was, that was some good, good information. Like that right gets, my, gets my motor run. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know that we're going to talk about the e-collars later on, and maybe Chris is going here. Uh, how did you transition from the bird dog world over to the hound world? I've been running hounds, I think, five or six years now, and I live right here at the base of the mountains, and there's black bears and mountain lions and a few bobcats, right? I mean, just miles from my house. Mm-hmm. And... Um, then bird numbers have kind of dropped a little bit. You know, the chuckers are harder and harder to find. And so we spent a lot of time in Arizona and South Dakota traveling. But it was like, 
I drew my first lion tag, I think 10, 10 years ago and a houndsman, uh, that was right. I had an insurance uh, practice at the time and he was a title company right across the hall. He became a really good friend and he took me out and we went hunting several times and finally I was able to harvest, uh, you know, a young male, uh, lion. And man, when that, what was really neat for me was just changing the pace and changing the scenario of watching bird dogs work to watching these hound dogs work a lion track. And that was just like, Holy cow, where's this been all my life? Well, I right. think if I may, have, I, I do maybe think that if I would have started with hound dogs, I don't know that I ever would have found bird dogs because <laughs> the, the thrill and the excitement is, <laughs> is, is uh, a lot of fun. So. You know, I made a slight detour uh, in the opposite direction one time, Jared. I was stationed in northern Japan in, uh, from 1970 to 73. Of course, no coon hunting over there, and uh, but they do have pheasants. They have a couple of kinds. They have a green pheasant called a Kiji pheasant that's like our ring neck, but it doesn't have a ring. And then they have the uh, copper pheasant called a Yamadori, which is more uh, ha- the habitat for those is more like our rough grouse out east here. So through an ad in the base newspaper, I found there were a couple pointer puppies for sale. And so I went and bought one of those puppies and attempted to train him to be a bird dog, knowing nothing at all about it. And I'm sure that uh, what I ended up with was uh, it was evident (laughs) that I knew nothing about it. But he was a natural retriever, for which I I heard is is rare for an English pointer. Maybe, is that true or not? Um, on certain bloodlines, yes, they're mm-hmm. there for a long, long time. You know, the plantation dogs were uh, they all they wanted was them to go out and point and establish point, hold point, and then they would send the flushing dogs off the right off the off the mm-hmm. carriage to do the rest, and they were just to stand there mm-hmm. and look look good. So, I think well, for a long time they were bred that way. Well, I've been accused of going down right rabbit path, so I'll hold a little story about that dog, Casey, for another time. But, uh, yeah, so actually, uh, you know, I made a detour because I'm a dog man, and I had to have some kind of a hunting dog. I couldn't just yes. go c- cold turkey for three years. Uh, right. But I picked up where I left off when I came home, for sure. But it's interesting. Yeah, I took my own detour as well. I had I was into uh, Labradors and actually Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. I had a lab and then got into Chessies and and uh, I think a dog man's a dog man. You just like watching a good dog work. And I've I've walked behind a lot of Ger- uh, German short hairs and and uh, watched them work and got a lot of thrill out of that. And I'm the same. I'm the same way as you, Jared. I think if I would have started with the German short hair, I may have never found hounds. So, and that would have been a really tough row to hoe back here in Indiana because our bird numbers are dismal. Um, but, uh, sure. yeah, that's interesting for sure. Um, so the area you're hunting in out there, let's, we kind of covered a little bit of it, but what part of Utah are you in out there? I am three hours north of Las Vegas, Nevada, and three hours south of Salt Lake City, Utah, right on Interstate 15. Um, pretty much desert, dry. It, it, it's it's pretty tough hounding um, and, and bird dogging, too. It's the, the conditions are horrible. I mean, I don't think we've had rain here for five or six months now. So really? We tried to, tried to move a bear. Yeah, it's it's we get a lot of snow. Typically, we get good snow up in the mountains, and they're above us, you know. Um, but right here in the valley, we get a foot or two in the winter. Um, but mm-hmm. Yeah, I, sagebrush in the valleys, and then obviously the aspens and the and the conifers up up at the higher elevations, which we love to do that up there. It's it's fun to chase bears in the summer up there where it's cool. <laughs> so yeah, what kind of fun, what kind of fun. summertime highs do you hit there where you're at? Uh, down in town, it'll be like 90, 90, but when you climb the 10,000 feet, you know, you're dropping in the early mornings, you can get those 65, 70 mornings and mm-hmm. enjoy a good race. And then, you know, by one or two, you're pretty much done. 
Yeah. Warm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's kind of dive into was, some of this e-collar stuff, and and I want to keep it pretty basic because I think we got a, we have an opportunity here uh, to make a few episodes uh, with you about e-collar training, but I'd like to start sure. at the very basics and what you do with a puppy to get them prepared for e-collar training and then what we have always known as collar conditioning and then you know maybe break into some real basic e-collar training if we could just cover those three topics for now and kind of see where it heads and where it leads us leaves us an opportunity to get jared moss back on the podcast so you, you want know. you want to start out with um, puppies? I, yeah, and, and I like how you uh, you know you teed that that up with prepared with a puppy. Um, we do a lot of I, I mean a lot of leash work, right? And we start off with a little teeny parachute cord and a little light collar on a twelve week old, ten week old pup, and we let him drag it around for a while. He gets used to getting pulled and yanked and stepping on it and get all used to that. And then we go to a, a little heavier check cord and leash when he's probably, you know, in, in the bird dog world, we always, I get these calls all the time that says, what should my, well, my puppy's six months old. He should be doing this. Cause I read it on the internet and I laugh and I say, okay, well, let's talk about the maturity level of your dog and not the physical age. So I try to, I try to help people always think of that. Think mm-hmm. about the maturity level of your dog. Cause some dogs mature quicker than others. And if you take a little pup and he's just bold and confident, man, you blow through him dragging that rope around in one or two days, you know, and then you start picking up the rope and start teaching him to recall or start teaching him to heal or come and go with you. And um, we do a lot of that leash work as a foundation, probably until that pup's three or four months of age, you know, kind of mature. He's used to that leash. He's used to that tug. He's used to getting, you know, we use a lot. We use a long line to teach recall. And then we've taught everything through the line. We, when they get just a little bit older, a little more confident, and it's kind of the, the marker there is when that dog starts pulling you pretty, pretty hard on your leash or your long line, you're kind of getting pulled down the road. Then it's time to add the next layer of training and the next tool, which is what we have found to be a leather training collar. And it's similar, you know, we see, uh, some people call it a pinch collar. Uh, Dale Marsh Smith and those guys have a wonder lead, which is basically a pig and string. But the idea is you want something that will contract, will, will tighten a choke chain or a, a, I can't remember what else the other term they use, but it'll, it'll tighten on the dog's neck with, with a little bit of resistance. And then it'll release as you um, release the resistance. So the, the tool that for me that has changed everything was the leather training collar. And I watched Dave Walker um, use that collar and take dogs that were pulling people all over the country and teach them to walk a hill in literally, you know, two or three small sessions. Mm-hmm. And, and I, when I saw I looked that at your picture. collar. It, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. No, no. That leather collar just helped me. So where I'm going with this is it's a tool that's going to help us get to using the e-collar. That leather collar creates a point of contact on their neck. It has a little stud in the, in the on the inside. It doesn't hurt the dog in any way, shape, or form. But it creates this point of contact on his neck that he gets used to feeling, oh, when that tightens up, I either need to quit pulling or I need to turn with this guy or I need to pay attention to start creating focus. And... That leather, that leather collar, when used correctly, keys you up for using an e-collar, and the transition is seamless. It, it makes it so that you pretty much can't mess up with the electronic collar. So instead of jumping straight from a leash or a long line to the e-collar, there's this tool that helps us bridge that gap. And it's, in, in a nutshell, when I started training professionally i talked to a lot of different trainers and their biggest frustration was i train this dog to a level send him home and then the guy calls me two or three weeks two or three weeks later and he says i can't get the dog to heal or i can't get him to come back i can't get him to do these things so we when we 
talked to hundreds of trainers that had that frustration. It was like, okay, we need to develop a system that's very simple and very transferable from us to send a client when he picks up the dog. That leather tool helps that transition so smoothly. So I'm getting deep here, but. Um, well, Jared, yeah, can I jump having, in? It's having, yeah. No, go, okay, I, I apologize, but I'm anticipating questions. What sure. specifically is this tool again? Where can it be obtained? How? Um, I know that we're going to get those kind of questions. Yes. And I hope Steve can maybe just drop a link in here because I could help okay. everybody find that tool. Okay. But what right. we have done as it is, it, it, you can buy it online. Uh, the ones I've bought online fall apart pretty quick. They're cheaply made. So I have, I've, did, yeah. I've lined up a gentleman that we can create all the ones that we need. Uh, we make it out of a leather skirting. It's a saddle skirting leather, and it's stitched um, as as like a saddle maker would make it, and the leather is very resilient. It's it's basically the, the concept. It would be like a choke chain, um, but it's, it's wider. The leather collar is maybe an inch and a half wide, and it has these little studs on the inside. They're like rivets. They're rounded. They're not they're not pointy. But if I could describe it to you, that's that's how I would do that. And there's if you actually to get on my Instagram. I have yeah. There's actually a picture of it on your website on on a puppy. Um, I picked up yeah. on that when I was looking at your website and 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 saw that piece of equipment. It looks fairly easy to make. Uh, looks simple. Um, so yep. in our hounds, you know, one of the things that that I see a lot of and steve has talked about this a lot too but the typical houndsman takes their dog out of the box they they snap a leash on it if they didn't take the leash off of it when they put it in the box they put a leash on the dog and then they get Uh pulled down to the point where they get tired of leading the dog or they're going to turn it loose with the dog extended all the way in at the end of the leash and coughing and hacking and choking and and we look at that as he's enthusiastic so uh, my question is how have you noticed any uh, any potential damage or or anything like that for the dog's desire to hunt simply because you were teaching it obedience at a very young age the answer is no because when I get my dog, uh, uh, let me put it this way. The, the guys that I hunt with on the housing side, when I pull my dogs, when my dogs come out of the box and I invite them out of the box, and I have this handle on my dogs where I talk to them and call them by name, they come over and I put the Garmin on them, I put the TT15 on there. And then we go for a walk, I get the comment like, holy cow, I've never seen hounds act this way. I've never seen hounds be called off a tree and just walk away. I've never seen hounds get in and out of the truck or not. I don't have any leashes typically. And so, but I have developed a bond with those dogs, that connection with those dogs through obedience and through teaching and communicating and coaching them that is so much higher. So when you tell me, hey, there's this guy that's getting drugged from his truck to the woods to release his dog, in my mind, it's 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 uh, all it is is a lack of communication, and saying, "Hey, bud, we're gonna go hunting. Before we get hunting, let's get our mind right and let's stop and think and use. You know, there's so much training between the truck and the woods that's gonna create a better bond with your dog and a and a stronger connection with your dog. And when you get those connections and those bonds, that hound will give you everything in his heart. I mean, he'll hunt harder for you." He'll go, he'll go harder. It's just, so, no, I, ha- I have actually seen the, the contrary. When you create that obedience and you create that focus and that connection, man, the, the dogs just love you more. They just want to do more. They want to go harder. They want to go faster. They want to do better. Interesting. That's good stuff because uh, for years I was, I've always tried to, put some obedience in in dogs but i also was listening to the the chatter that you don't want to put too much obedience in your dog and 
for me personally, I can actually, I was too heavy handed with, with a few dogs that I've had, including retrievers. And I took some of the hunt out of them because I was too heavy handed. I was too worried about, you know, the obedience part. And I was kind of squashing their whole spirit. And so talk to us a little bit about how you, um, do that kind of training without, without just crushing this young dog. Yeah. And so we step back to training a dog is not difficult if you have a system. It is not hard. It's very simple. Where, where we mess up is we don't, we're not consistent and we don't take the time. We get in a rush. So if we step back to that conversation we were having with those little puppies and we, and we form this little bond where we call him and he comes to us and he loves us and wants to be with us. And, um, but at the same time, we're still going for walks. We're still waking up his nose. We're still getting him bold and confident and we want him to think he's King Kong. So it's not, it's not, uh, I don't want to take any hunt out of the dogs at, at, at all. I want all that hunt there. I want every ounce of drive I can get. In fact, I'm going to do things to build that. But um, I think where we miss out is we don't have a little bit of a system. We don't have a system and we don't have structure. And so then when we do try to correct a dog, for example, we go back to the truck and he's just yanking us down the thing. And all of a sudden we start yanking on that leash and we we're trying to get him to heal. And he's like, what the heck's heal? I don't, I don't even know what that means. You know, we haven't done any of this work for six months, eight months, ten months. I'm a year old now, and you want me to stop pulling on the leash? <laughs> and then, so if you build them from the, the ground up the right way, all that's eliminated. Um, and you don't have to be harsh. That's the one thing I found in the bird dog world was you do not need to yank a dog's neck off. You do not need to be heavy-handed. I, I'm, I'm guilty of that. You know, a lot of the old school training methods were, were, were pretty heavy handed. And, and I went down that road and I soon learned that that, like you said, squashed desire, squashed heart and confidence. And so you don't need to be that way. To, and, uh, but still you can still have structure and obedience and have focus and have a dog that knows his job. And, yeah. Steve, you so, got break that down. How, yeah, go, go ahead, guys. Go, go ahead and finish that, uh, Jared, and I, I'll speak to it. I, I think the key then is time and um, having a systematic approach to it so that when the dog does get confused or gets frustrated because you're asking him something, you can go back one step in your training and be like, oh, okay, let's rebuild your confidence and then and then we'll go to this. Yeah, we don't want a dog that sits at our feet. We're not going to catch any game if he's sitting at our feet. But there's no reason that dog shouldn't come when he's called or load up when he lo- when he needs to come home or can't walk on a loose leash. I mean, that's just that's just simple mechanics and, and being systematic and having a system and following it. Well, Jared, I'm sitting here amening everything <laughs> that you're saying. I, I've always enjoyed a dog with a handle, a dog that uh, – you know, can be called across that stream back to me when the uh, the water's over my boots type thing. And uh, I've enjoyed hunting a dog like that for the last 11 years. Uh, I've had them before. This one just seemed to have the aptitude to to accept any of that type of training that I wanted to give him. But you used a, a word that I've used so many times and talking to people and they ask me about training dogs and I'm not a trainer, but the word consistency. And I think that's what for me it boils down to. And I, and uh, of course I, you're, you're the guy that I want to listen to. I don't want to, I don't want to teach the class. I want to listen, but I do uh, absolutely agree with what you're saying. Uh, starting at a young age with these puppies Uh, You know, I happen to use uh, food as a reward uh, in the training of this particular dog, Uh, and and, um, that worked very well with him, and I'm sure there's other other methods. You could have got a hoss to drive your truck for you for a peanut butter dog biscuit. 
<laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember that, when you're bringing hoss right. up. And real quick, I mean, I know we're talking about dogs, but this is a funny story. So we went when we were expecting our first kid. My wife decided that we needed to go to a parenting class, and I'd been a dog trainer or professional canine handler, nothing like what you're doing, Jared. But um, had some experience with dog training, and of course, it, we're going to this parenting class through our church and we're all sitting there in this small group setting and we're talking about the keys of being a successful parent and it came to behavior issues and I sat here and I listened to all these people talk about all this stuff and and it went everywhere and I wasn't saying anything and finally our our uh, pastor asked me he said uh, Chris you've been quiet what do you think and I said well I think that being a parent sounds like it's about like training a dog. You you instruct them and teach them what you want them to do. You reinforce what you want them to do. And you be consistent. That's all there is to it. And it's served me well in parenting and it's served me well in dog training. So, um, Jared, you got any follow-ups on the it? podcast right there? <laughs> we, we got a lot more stuff to cover yeah. than that. No, no, I, no, I think that's exactly right, guys. It's uh, simple. It's structure. It's consistency. It's patience. <laughs> and and when you mold all those together, you know, uh, yeah, it, it just the end result is a dog that hunts his heart out, but he's also enjoy to be around. I mean, there's nothing nicer than having your dog come in and lay down by the fire and be your buddy. But when a dog that, you know, when a dog's just crazy and you can't even get him to sit down or settle down a little bit, no, nobody really enjoys that dog. And then you don't, you know, if you bring somebody new into the sport and your dog's jumping all over him and plowing him over and running him down, he just, it's just, it's not, uh, it's not a enjoyable experience versus a dog that's, you know, when you tell him to get on the box and he jumps up there and stands, wait, waits for you to hook him up so you can start rigging. Let's get into some of this e-collar magic. Because I think most people, you people, um, unless you've got something, Steve, did you have something you want to follow up on there? No, not at all. Just, just absolutely agreeing with Jared, and and we witnessed this same type of performance out of a pack of thirteen running dogs. Yes, we did uh, a, a while back in South Texas when we hunted with Shorty Gorham, um, dogs that absolutely were under voice command. Um, were polite. <laughs> it's a, it's they were a the only word I can think. They waited they were their gen- turn. They were gentlemen, they, they were, were gentlemen and ladies, absolutely. And and that really shouldn't, um, you know. It, it makes you think. Why don't we all do this, right? <laughs> How much more would we enjoy these hounds if we would just take this time to to create that kind of bond with them and and. Uh, So anyway, so to get to that level, Jared, I'm curious, how much time are we actually talking about? I've got a puppy here. I just brought it home and I want to, you see this question on the social media all the time. When should I start my puppy? And that in and of itself, I think people get confused about what starting a puppy actually means. But if I'm going to start making a gentleman dog out of my puppy how often, how long, you know, when does that start? Great question. Remember your dog is always learning. He's always learning. So it's starting from day one. Uh, I tell, I tell all my bird dog clients when they take that puppy home, a lot of our dogs live in the house with our clients at this stage in life. Um, Hey, your home is a privilege and we're going to teach this little guy how to be a gentleman in the kitchen. We're going to fence off the kitchen, and he's going to be a gentleman in the kitchen. And when he's a gentleman and he knows how not to bite stuff and chew and jump and scratch and be crazy, then we'll we'll, uh, reward him and give him a little bit more uh, area in the home. Puppy training is really, really simple, and you want to keep your sessions really short. I mean, it can be as simple. One One of the great things that I do with my kids is that feeding time. You're going to feed your puppy typically twice a day anyway. 
take an extra two or three minutes, two minutes, and I take my little daughter, Kinsley or Kobe or Kyson, and I give them a handful of kibble, and they walk 10 or 15 feet away from me. And then I stand 10 or 15 feet away back, and we start teaching that puppy to come to us by using his name or using here. And every time he comes to us, we give him a piece of his lunch or breakfast or dinner. And he's learning that, hey, dude, this guy's got some dinner over there, and he's also learning to come when he's called. And, man, that makes, you know, you want to start a teaching a dog to recall. Make it a game. Make it fun. Make it enjoyable. And then feed him at the same time. You're killing two birds with one stone. It only takes a couple extra minutes. Mm-hmm. That's a great way to get things going with, with recall. And then we do the leash thing like we talked about. And it's only, I, I, remember with puppies, keep it fun and keep it short and then repetitive. Dogs are dogs learn through repetition. Um you know, a lot of times I think we mess up because we take, we get busy all week and we don't do anything all week. And then on Saturday we got two hours and we're going to try and make up for it. <laughs> and that, that sounds familiar. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work, right? So Guilty. Just, um, I would say some five or ten minutes a day. Not even that, really. Ten minutes a day of just, hey, we're going to work on recall this this week or hey we're going to work on leash training this week and with those little guys man if you do five or ten minutes of structure each day you're going to start seeing him enjoy it and he's going to dogs dogs thrive on structure they love being they love it when they're the leader and they just have to be the pack so that little bit of structure of recall and leash training uh just a few minutes each day will start paying huge dividends and, you know, Jared, in my experience, these dogs remember that training, that early training so well, even when it's not applied for a while. And my case in point is this tree and walker hound that I have. Uh, I took him, uh, I guess he was about eight, eight or nine months old, uh, up to the breeder in, in Pennsylvania in April. Uh, now I had done essentially what you're talking about with this pup here at home and he does live in the house. Uh, he doesn't have full run of the house. He has certain areas that he is permitted. Uh, and, uh, but just an example, the command kennel is something I use to mean, I want you to get in the crate. I want you to get in the box. I want you to get, go through a door that's in front of you. And, I use that term with this dog. Well, then I took him to Pennsylvania, and I'm sure that that uh, my friend Randy up there never uses that word. I've observed him with his dogs are very well behaved. He's never used the word kennel. I bring him home here a couple weeks ago, uh, went up and picked him up, brought him home. And immediately, you know, when I wanted him to get in the crate, I said, kennel cruise, and he went 20 feet right straight into that kennel and laid down. Now, he had not been, you know, that that command had not been issued to him, I'm sure, in how many months is that, five, six months? But he remembered it. And do you believe that, that you know, we imprint these pups at a young age and it's something that will stay with them for life? Or do you feel that it should be, you know, um, con- a continued process. And I, and I'm, I figure you're going to say the latter, but it was just kind of interesting to me to see that he hadn't forgotten some of the things I taught him, even though he hadn't experienced them in, in five or six months. What I have found is by being really soft handed and gentle with these small guys, you know, a puppy that's under six months of age, you can do so much training before he's ever even old enough really to go in the woods and just blow down a tree. So yeah, I, they are a sponge from eight, from seven weeks, five, six weeks old, that from five weeks on that dog. I mean, we breed full time. We make a living training and breeding dogs. We're around mm-hmm. them every day. This is what we do. A puppy that's five, six weeks of age, man, he is learning behavior so fast. And so they are, they absorb so much. We used to wait until a dog was eight or 10 months and have them bring him to the kennel. Not anymore. We have them bring, 
I want those puppies here at 16 weeks of age. At four months of age, I want them for 30 days. And I can teach that pup in 30 days so much that he will carry through the rest of his life. Mm. If I miss that window on that first six months, if I miss that window, um, man, the, the, the road is much harder to hoe later on. It can get, we can get it done. That's not a problem, but it's, it's so much easier and funner <laughs> when you do it with these little guys as a game and then condition that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, if you take the time up front, it will pay, pay huge later mm. on. I mean, we've had guys that we've trained their dogs for them. They've been activated, gone to Iraq for a couple of years and come back. And literally in a matter of minutes, they have that dog back to the level of training. He was, you know, they left him, they left him in the care of the neighbor or their uncle or their wife took care of him. And then things kind of got a little hectic, you know, and, and dad wasn't around and dad comes back and literally in a matter of, you know, a day, he's got him right back to where he should be. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Well, Chris, I took us down another rabbit path there, though, but I, I'm really interested in seeing how he applies the e-collar. Well, I'll tell train. you what, though. I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all this, and I think that that's a different chapter. I mean, that's a whole different chapter, and, and what we're talking about right now is valuable. I mean, you, Jared, just based on oh, what, yeah. you, what you said about, you know, that four-month to six-month window there, uh, you know, maybe not ready for an e-collar, maybe not ready to go to the woods, but there's so much work to be done on the front end of this thing that I think that that it uh, it merits an in-depth discussion. So I don't think we've we've cheated anybody out of anything, even though we want to talk about e-collars. It's a building block. I don't think we can move on to e-collars until we we've examined this mm-hmm. topic pretty thoroughly. Would you agree with that, Jared? Yeah, I think this. And, and um, found, we call it foundation training. The foundation, think of this just like building your house. You know, that foundation needs to be rock solid. Before we get to adding, you know, an e-collar or before we get to expecting anything like uh, a, a dog to heal through a group of people or to heal, you know, all the way through the words and be real. Yeah, that foundation is crucial, guys. Mm-hmm. Like, no amount of work later on is going to carry the same amount of weight that you, the same, you're not going to gain near, near as much. Um, and those, those early stages, man, between under six months of age, a few minutes a day is going to gain so much more than you will ever be able to do later on. You'll just never, you'll never get that time back. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I've seen dogs, come here and go through our program and at 10 months of age they're doing work that most three-year-old dogs are doing and it's not that we pushed them harder or we were mean or we were forceful it was just like hey we're going to speak your language and we're going to talk to you i think another thing we need to cover not today but another time is nonverbal communication your body language oh my gosh guys we we have so many guys that are missing the mark with body language Mm-hmm. You come out of your truck mad and, and had a bad day at work and you go pick up your dog and you want to train him. <laughs> whoa, 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 brother. Stop. Yeah. Go get you a Coke. Go get you a drink. Get you a beverage. And let's get our mind right and get our bodies to train the right language before we ever go back and touch that four-month-old or three-month-old pup. Yeah, I had a an older houndsman one time tell me or an older trainer tell me the exact same thing. You know, if... if if you're not in the right frame of mind when you take that dog to the woods, you're going to do more damage than you are um, giving him any kind of training or any benefit to him at all. So if you find yourself frustrated, it's better not to not to hunt or at least recognize it and put him back in the box and maybe take it up the next day until until you're in the right frame of mind to do that. And, right. you know, some of the body language stuff uh, – talk about that right now that'd be that'd be this is the time to do it i feel Nonverbal communication is a huge staple in our training program i can literally get dogs to heal recall whoa i can do all those things without saying a a word dogs don't don't speak english they don't speak german they don't speak french they don't speak spanish but they speak body language that's the world they live in and so 
um, I can simply bend over and invite my dogs to me just by bending my, my body and showing them because I taught them at, 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 you know, eight weeks of age when I had that little piece of kibble in my hand. Hey, when I bend over and I, and I have this little bit of tone in my voice that says, come on, I like you, come here, whatever. Man, I, I, later on, I've done that for four or five weeks with that little puppy. Later on, I can look at my hounds in the road and I can bend over and they'll run to me. I don't even say their name. Don't even say a word. But my body language invites them to come to me. And we could talk about that for hours. But um, one of the things that I had to learn with working dogs was to help them get focused. I needed to be calm and focused. I needed to get my body language in check. And my and so I would, you know, clear my mind and, and relax and bring down my anxiety or excitement and, and just kind of be calm. And then I would pull that dog into me and I would pull him really close as I get to his heartbeat right up there by my chest. And I just hold him there for a second and he would feel that I was calm and then that would calm him down. A lot of these little guys, these little puppies that are four or five weeks old or something and, and they get all excited and you got young kids around at my house. You know, I've got uh, a little boy that's now three and I've got four kids and I've had to teach these working dogs that have all this energy and excitement to come in and calm down. And when they're around these little kids, they got to calm down and be calm. Well, I do that through my body language and, 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 and touch the way I, well, the way I pet those dogs, the way I touch those dogs, the way I pull them in and, and show them how to be calm. And when you start doing that, man, those dogs want to be with you. They're like, holy cow, I've never, never accessed, you know, I've never been calm before. <laughs> and all of a sudden when they're calm, then you can start teaching them, right? It's like, hey, I'm, you get this wild, crazy puppy and he's jumping up on Kip, you know. Here's this eight, here's a 10-week-old puppy who's jumping up on Kip because he's like, hey, let's play, Kip, let's play. And that's his body language. Jump up, let's play. And Kip's running away going, dude, he's got sharp fingernails and he's kicking my butt. And so Kip starts running away and the dog starts chasing Kip. And, mm-hmm. and now, now we got this let's chase Kip scenario going on. And I say, Hey Kip, come here. <laughs> and Kip runs over and I grab Kip and I grab the pup and I grab Kip in one arm and the pup in the other arm. And I pull them both in real close and I just stop. And I hold that puppy kind of close to my heart and kind of close. And I pull in Kip and Kip's like, dad, he's jumping on me. And I'm like, no, 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 let's teach him to be calm. And, and, uh, so we start showing him and Kip calms down and I calm down and the puppy calms down and it might only be 10 seconds. So that pup all of a sudden goes, Whoa, what I really wanted was to play with this guy. I wanted some affection. I wanted some uh, interaction. And the way I got it was when I just calmed down by these two and, and they, man, dogs learn that so fast. So that's, that's one of the ways that we use our body language to start teaching these guys, hey, it's a, it's a, it's a, we want to have fun. There's a time and place to go play and have fun, and then there's a time and place to turn it on, right, and let's go to work and mm-hmm. let's, let's pull this tree down. But there's a time and place when we're in the backyard having a hamburger. We don't need to. I think Calvin, you know, Calvin in his podcast a little bit ago just talked about this. His dogs know when they're around the house that they're not getting ready to go hunting. Right. Now, if they hear that tailgate drop, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a whole different game, right? It's yeah. Just, it's funny. Yep. Yep. That was just on uh, this podcast this week. about it. We were talking about uh, manners around the house briefly there. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. that is such a, a great topic. And here's an experiment for everybody. Okay, because this is a typical situation. Okay, you're trying to catch, you're trying to recall your dog, and it doesn't even take a whole lot of training. Um, Maybe the dog hasn't ever been trained like this, but instead of standing, you know, chasing that dog, you're frustrated because you can't catch your dog, and now you're you're trying to bust through the brush to get your hands on that dog because you're going to teach him something. Just step back, get your dog's attention, and then squat down. Just squat down and open your arms yeah. and see if that dog doesn't come to you. I've used that so much. It's it's like you said, the body language. If I'm busting through the brush, that dog already knows he's in trouble. Here comes dad. He's not happy. I'm not stopping because sure. I can outrun him. But if you stop, yep. kneel down, talk to him, open your arms, he'll come to you. Nine times out of ten. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I've used that for all of my life as a hounds person. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it absolutely works. And uh, without really thinking about it that much, you know, I used to just think, well, I'm putting myself down on the dog's level and the dog uh, is relating to me better than me being this imposing character that's that's uh, you know lording over him type thing but uh, good stuff yeah, and then the next step there is actually to, to, to turn and walk away when oh, we absolutely. get young puppies that have a bird in their mouth for the first time they get all excited they want to pack that bird around they don't want to bring you the bird all you got to do is turn around and start walking the truck next thing you know puppy's right there at your feet packing the bird and he's like he just retrieved and he didn't even know it <laughs> exactly so it's, <laughs> yeah body language is huge right yes so, Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, a life with dogs is such a wonderful life, isn't it? Mm. I'll tell you what. And, is and that, Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. My dogs have actually taught me to be a better person. I mean, that sounds pretty deep. But, you know, if if in retrospect, I've looked at looked at how I've treated dogs and, and interacted with my dogs and it's actually bridged that gap of how to interact with people and vice versa, you know, vice versa. Dogs, dogs are that receptive of our affection, our attention. And there's a lot, a lot you can learn. And that's one of the things that, that I just love about being a houndsman is, is being able to relate to that dog. And, and, uh, sometimes I need to remind myself that, that my dogs don't get all my energy. You know, I've got to, I've got to be able to bring that back in the house and, and handle my family is with the same amount of importance that I handle my dogs. But this isn't a family pot, family, uh, training podcast. It's about training dogs. So sorry for that rabbit path, but I wondered when no, Dr. Ruth was going to be on. Is she, na <laughs> is she in the green room? Yes. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way. When a dog's brought into our kennel, I can tell you a lot about the person that brought the dog in by the way the dog acts. Mm. Let's put it that way. So, Ex expand on that. Expand There's on nothing, that a little bit. Yeah. Ex seriously, expand if on that have, a little bit. Um, well, I'll give you an example. I have a dog in for training right now that's a dog that was a puppy that was bought from us as a puppy. The guy took him home, and out of the, out of fear of not knowing what to do, he did nothing. And the guy's very anxious. He's a very anxious, nervous type guy. Well, now I've got an eight-month-old dog that didn't get a lot of training, didn't get exposure, didn't get socialized, didn't, you know, he didn't, he doesn't know how to, where to go in the woods, except for this little path around the guy's house that he took him on. You know, the same little walk he went on every day. Now that you take that dog and, you know, when I first got the dog, I started working the dog and I could tell I've been doing this long enough. I, I mean, we've trained thousands of dogs. I could tell what had happened, but the guy wasn't really forthcoming about what he, you know, and he finally broke down and said, Hey, you know, I just didn't do a lot. And I'm a really anxious person. I'm a very, um, nervous person. I thought, okay, now it's starting to make sense. Because I have this dog that is very anxious. It's very nervous. It kind of, you know, as a puppy with me, she was bold and confident and crazy. And now I've got this kind of skittish, scared, nervous dog. And I'm like, we got to get you back to bold and confident. And and we'll, we'll get her there. But, you know, it, it's funny how that dog has picked up those traits from his owner and um, his lack of exposure and his lack of time. And the time he did spend with the dog was, oh, crap, I don't know what to do. I don't, I'm don't. i just going to mess you up, so I'm not going to do anything, and we're just going to sit here and be nervous the whole time. And that dog absorbed everything that that guy taught him, non-verbally, right? Just mm -hmm. through his body language, through his actions, through, through doing nothing, the end result was actually far worse than getting out there and trying, trying to do it, even if you do it wrong. So my, my big message to everybody is um, the fit – being nervous to fail in dog training, that failure to not do anything actually is, is doing something. It's a, the end result is, is very, is not well, is not great. So I would rather have you guys go out there and try and fail 
and uh, keep trying and keep failing because it won't take very long. You'll figure it out. <laughs> but if you can't figure it out, then you can find one of those mentors. So you find one of those guys that's tried and failed a thousand times and is like, yeah, don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. Do it this way. Mm-hmm. And man, I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Then all of a sudden the dog does what you ask him to do and, and uh, we're all bold and confident and everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm it, I'm hearing it, it, everything it's here. It's very interesting how. Yeah, I'm hearing, I'm hearing that it's important. If we want to be successful, then we have to be be prepared, or we need to prepare to be successful. And there's a lot of life lessons. So everything sure. that you on this topic, it it brought up a question for me. Okay, and and I think uh, a lot of a lot of us feel that. Uh, let me see how I want to put this and get it get it articulated correctly. I think the overall feeling in the hound community <clears throat> is that the success rate of dogs finishing out is low. Um, you know, overall, you take a litter of 10 puppies. If you can get three of those puppies to turn into successful game catching hounds then you're doing doing pretty good my question for you jared is that a genetic problem or is that a human problem a problem that has been put into those hounds by by being mishandled i think it's both okay because and i'll tell you why when i started breeding bird dogs i was after a certain type of dog i took me what i did was i got on the airplane and i got in the truck and i drove across the country and i went to the 10 major short hair kennels that i i thought were producing the dog i was after i spent a decade of doing that right and we could have a litter of short hair puppies out of 10 puppies eight of them are going to be well above average You know, a couple of them are going to be rock stars and a couple will be average. And when I got in the hound world, I got super frustrated because I would go and try to replicate that process. I would go to people, houndsmen, that were, you know, very successful making a living with their dogs, for example, and they were guiding and outfitting. And I would get a pup from them, and that pup was dumb as rocks. And I'm like, how in the world? How is this guy training these type of dogs to do that? The genetics weren't there. Okay. And I, it didn't take me about a year or two to figure that out, right? But then I also I also feel like there are a lot of dogs that because of the way that they are handled, yes, they do not make it, they, or they you know they don't make it as a finished hound. So I think it's two parts. I don't think it's all genetics, but I don't think it's all um, handling either. I it, for me, it's uh, my conclusion has been a mixture. Interesting. One, one thing that I learned was there there are some hounds out there, man. Let's put it this way: if you ha- if you have oh, there's a houndsman that's up here in northern Utah, the guy is phenomenal. He has a pack of eight, ten, twelve dogs that are just rock stars, right? He can take an average dog or a less than average dog and hunt that dog for three years inside that pack, and they will and that pack will elevate that dog. They will make him better than any any of us could have ever made him, and they will put him up, you know. And then that, and then I go get that dog from that guy, and then I try to start a breeding program off of that. Um, the genetics might not be, at, well, the dog might not be at uh, going to throw a puppy that's as easy for a beginner or somebody else to train. You know, Jared, I I, uh, I don't know if that made any sense mm-hmm. or not, but that. The, you know, I found that in the bird dog world, it was like, I needed a puppy that was able to go out and point and retrieve and do a lot of those things naturally for a beginner type person to be successful. Otherwise they were going to be super frustrated because they didn't want to wait three years to get a dog that was average. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They wanted something that, you know, in the first year they are six months, they could see a result. So, Mm. well, uh, I'm listening to what you're saying, Jared, agreeing again and thinking about I wrote a piece for American Cooner magazine called Who's to Blame? And it was talking about when we encounter that pup, like you said, that's apparently dumb as a box of rocks and and 
very difficult to work with and who's to blame you know is it the breeder or is it the trainer and uh, there were a lot of pros and cons on both sides but and i think also in in a recent writing about this thing in the competition world of coon hunting where people now are are pretty much requiring a dog to be a very very wide hard hunting dog uh, with the hope that that dog will go so far, uh, get away from the rest of the pack, so to speak, get a, a hot coon trail, get it treed, use up most of the clock before the judge has time to get there and score the dog and win the hunt. And, but the question came up in, a, in an article with a breeder that's uh, well known uh, about the fact, is that independence genetic or is it man-made and uh you know i think i think the balance weighs a little heavier uh on the genetic side in hounds maybe than it does on the trainer handler side um the old saying you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear but uh, the both are are equally important but both are factors that we have to consider, you know, when we evaluate uh, a top hound or we try to train uh, a puppy to become a top hound. But it's, it's interesting stuff for conversations. I, my own personal experience, my first bird dog when I was 15 named Lady, um, nothing against her, loved her to death, was a good dog. But I put, I put so much time into teaching her some of the simplest tasks. When my next dog was uh, Fritz, whose genetics were obviously about a hundred times better, he learned, he did so many things natural that the training process took so much less time. Fast forward two or three years later and lady could, she had, she was a good dog. Her range was different. The way she hunted was different. Um, and her natural ability to scent was different. I could watch Fritz wind a bird at 30 yards and then pin it, and Lady didn't have the capability to even smell it until she was 10 yards away. So I watched from a very young age, I watched the two different dogs, and it was like, whoa, okay, genetics are huge. Like, this is, I'm going to hedge my bet the best I can in my favor and uh, get the right genetics because it's going to make everything easier, faster, quicker, and uh, less stress on me as a trainer. I think you hit the nail on the head, Jared. That's what we have to do in this game is do our homework, you know, get pick that puppy that's going to give us those advantages and then, then uh, mold that puppy, so to speak, through the training that, you, that you're able to do. Great stuff. Chris? Yeah, I'm just uh, listening to this conversation, and and um, I would like to maybe Let, let's, go, go. Go ahead. I I was going to say say I would just like to uh, maybe put out an analogy or maybe develop a recipe here for success for for somebody who is picking out a, a puppy and and they eventually want to have a top top producing hound and and we'll keep it simple since we're going on uh we're going on an hour here and we're di in my opinion jared i think we've we've set up some real foundation for some real training for us for as trainers you know train the trainer type stuff so yeah, you bet. um what i would like what yeah. i'd like to do is is kind of set up a, the right recipe here um for success for houndsmen who are looking for those top hounds so um if i hear you right you know the first thing we need to look for is a very well-bred hound is that is that the genetics no doubt okay. that is no doubt so go ahead I and mean, run, it does run not matter that. if we're in the bird it doesn't matter if we're in the bird dog world or the hound world or if we're trying to teach cattle dogs when I tried to start building a living doing this, 
I needed a dog that I could fly to somebody in New York, never meet the guy, and say, yeah, this dog will do this, this, and this. Because he is programmed. I mean, he's built that way. He came out of the came out of the box doing that. And so I I don't claim to be the guy that did that all that work. What I did do, though, is I went and found guys that have been breeding for 30, 40, 50, 60 years who had a program. And Steve talks about this, this family breeding, having a program of breeding and I was able to take some of their dogs and some of these other guys dogs and then breed them into my and bring these families together and line breed and all I'm doing is is hedging the bet so that when somebody comes to best gun dogs and says hey I need a dog that can be a family dog and still go and produce in the field I know that's a tall order and I say no we do it every day that's what we do that's not enough that that we've got that figured out Mm-hmm. but I did it because I was able to go find these guys that have been doing it for a long, long, long time and build on top of that. And so in the hound world, if I was going to go get a pup and I've learned this the hard way, cause I went and got the hundred dollar classified pups. My wife laughed at me because here I built this thing, this whole program and this breeding program and all this stuff in the bird dog world. And then I went over to the hounds and started trying to make dogs out of these hundred dollar cat classified <laughs> dogs. And I'd get him up to a year or two, and I'd frustrated. And she she looked at me one day. I I will never forget this day. We were barbecuing on the back porch of our house. She looked at me. She turned to me and said, why are you doing this with the hound dogs? Why do you not just go get the best hound dog you can find? That's what you did with the bird dogs. Why are you not? And I said, I mean, I, here's a guy that makes a living doing it, right? And I got, oh, man, my wife put me right in my place. And I thought. No joke. Well, so we just, you know, the next step was we went and bought the nicest finished town we could find, and we started our packs from there, and life has been great ever since. So, yeah. Okay, so step one is find... In a nutshell. Step one is find those genetics. You better find the very, very best. Yes. Genetics is everything. And dogs that are performing at a level you you can go you know where these dogs are you know that they're operating the way that you need a hound to operate you know you don't go find something on on the east coast for you know this bread for a night hunt and expect it to dry ground hunt in in utah where you're at is that accurate and you don't take a dry ground dog yeah, from, from utah and expect to make it the next super stake champion back here in the east is that fair 100 percent correct because it was like when i first started out competing i was built i was built, i was running these german short hairs that were field trial bred dogs if i and we called them 90 10 dogs they wanted to be gone 90 percent of the time and 10 percent of the time they wanted you to feed them water and then let them go again mm-hmm. and uh, if i bring that type of dog in my house right now that dog would destroy my home just because of this genetic disposition so absolutely yes so I think it's, it warrants to say, find the right, find the guy that's hunting the type of the style of dog that you like. And, you know, don't, don't go get a uh, high octane. Don't go get a thoroughbred when you need a mule. Because if you try to take a thoroughbred and make him into a mule, you're, you're going to beat your head against the wall more than not. Right. So. Can I share something on this topic Jump in. just real quick Absolutely. here? Absolutely. You know, uh, having been with the breed of dogs, the plot breed, for so many years and um, in my family, still love the breed, uh, absolutely. But I found myself in the position of the person that you're talking about here just about a year and a half ago. I wanted to train another coonhound. I wanted to find the best bred coonhound pup that I could find, and I wanted to spend the time with it. And knowing, you know, that uh, at my age, you know, there may not not be a lot uh, of years that I can participate in this sport because it is uh, a sport for young people. But anyway, I watched a breeder. I watched his successes. I watched. I, I got to know the guy. I uh, I talked to him. He's even been a guest on our program here. And and I, I talked about, to him about his philosophy of breeding and talked about what he looks for and watched him how he would go and, and never be afraid to go and try this stud dog or that stud dog uh, to try to improve while he was line breeding these females generation after generation. 
And when you watch somebody that's totally dedicated that way, and then you see what they're producing. I went uh, here just a couple of weeks ago uh, and witnessed an eight-month-old puppy that was turned loose by herself in a rainstorm and watched her on the Garmin drive track hunt out, thoroughly hunt out a large section of woods, get treed at about 450 yards from us, hold her tree, drive around in the four-wheeler, and find two coons setting up over her head. Uh, you know, as a result of doing just exactly what I said, going out and finding a producing stud and breeding to the line that they've established. So all that I say is that, you know, and I've been very happy with the pup that I got. Uh, not saying that he's equal to, to what I witnessed <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, but he's a very nice pup. So th this is just good advice i think that you're giving uh jared and it certainly comes from years of experience on your behalf and uh, i've seen it recently put into uh practice and know that it works that what you're saying is absolutely true yep yep and i've seen seen the same thing and and uh, i think it just takes time you know it, people are we all get into fads, you know, so this, this hot new thing pops up and you want to go try that. We don't do our homework. We don't, you know, and then we get a, a, a puppy that's that, that, or from a family of dogs that really doesn't operate the way we want them to. So absolutely. So the first, just to boil this down, cause I don't, I want to be, um, very conscientious of your time, Jared, but so start with genetics. And then once you get it home, what are what are the things that need to happen right you, right then? You gotta have a you gotta have a system book. You gotta have a plan. So How does a person the, develop that plan? Uh, go find a, a mentor. Go find somebody that's done it already. Don't try and reinvent the wheel, and then follow their plan. And I tell this to my bird dog people all the time. YouTube is fantastic. Great, right? it's a great it's a great thing. It screws up more bird dogs than anything on the face of the earth because I get on YouTube and I start learning this one guy's method and I'm using his method and we're going straight along and we're doing great. And then I get to a hiccup and I don't know how to fix it or I don't know how to overcome that hiccup. And so then I turn on to somebody else's channel and then I'm on somebody else's channel. Next thing I know, I got four different styles or methods that I'm using with this poor little dog. Mm -hmm. I'm confused as the handler. I'm the handler. I'm confused. I'm frustrated. I don't know exactly what to do to get the dog to do it, whatever it is. And that confusion then transfers to my dog. Then I get frustrated and then they call Garrett or they call somebody or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you have to follow my program, but fo find a program that works for you that you feel comfortable with and then follow that guy's program. Because when you're going down the training path and you get to a level of like, oh man, I can't get in through this. If you've done the program and the guy's got a solid program, then you just take one step back in the program and rebuild confidence and regain structure and you stay confident. The biggest thing for us was helping people gain that confidence. So give them the, you know, empower them to have the confidence to train the dog. Mm -hmm. Without that, the, the, the people struggle. So you got to have a plan, find a system that works for you that you, that's proven. And there's some great trainers in the bird dog world. There's some great trainers in the hound dog world. Find those guys that have been doing this for years and years and years and learn from them. Why would you, why would you, yeah. To, to me, it, it just makes sense, right? Yeah. Just find, find that guy. If there's a local chapter, if there's a local hound chapter where you're at, go get involved and learn everything you can from those guys. Are there, there'll be guys in that chapter that are, you know, are, are good trainers. There'll be guys that are great and find those great ones and shovel their dog kennel for them, feed their dogs for them, do whatever you got to do to get some of his time. Mm. It'll be worth, it'll be worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a, we've got a genetic, genetically sound pup 
we've got a program or we're, we're yep. working to establish a program and then yep. we're going to stick to that program but daily handling needs to be consistent uh don't try to shove too much yep. stuff down the pup's throat at one time patience um anything else you want to throw in there um and then you're going to get to a point where you got to train you got to train like you hunt and i think there's a big connect when guys start going hunting they get frustrated because hey we went hunting today and the dog didn't do you know as well as i thought he would because he was doing this in a training area and I, and I say, well, okay, well, tell me where you were training. Well, we were training this real low grass. And then when we went and hunted pheasants in this high, tall, thick grass, he just mm-hmm. didn't do it. And I'm like, okay. You know, he went from minor league to major league over in one day. And your expectations, manage your expectations, train like you hunt, and, and build up from there. Be patient. It's uh, Everything takes time. I, we get... We're in a world today where you can click a button and have something on your doorstep in two days or the next day. <laughs> well, guess what? Dog training is not that way. So <laughs> you don't push the button, and then your dog is, you know, he's going to tree now because he did it one time. Doesn't mean he's going to do it the next day. You know, I mean, it takes patience and it takes. Um, you got to let that young dog develop. You know, he's got to make mistakes. He's got to go out there and bump a bird or take the track backwards you know he's got to figure those things out and, and uh, so we can do all the, the 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 training and the obedience that we've talked about but he still needs hunt time right he still needs time to learn how to be a dog and be a hound and yeah make mistakes and and you've got to be patient you know i have a lot of guys that call me and they have one bad episode and they throw their hands in the air and i'm like hey man one bad day does not warrant throwing the talent right don't even don't even worry about it chop that up one with a bad day and just go on to the next one right and they're like oh okay and then you know they give me a call two two weeks two weeks later and they're like my dog's doing phenomenal and i'm like yeah it happens man he, he's a young dog <laughs> he's his mature his maturity level is you know that of a six-year-old boy and you want him to do college level work yeah manage your expectations manage your expectations well, I- that's awesome well, we have this similar thing. You know, you have that young dog that bumps a bird or whatever. And we've got that promising young pup that trees a possum or, or you know, as you say, backtracks from the tree or whatever. And that one instant, you know, breaks our hearts because our expectations are so high. And I think you've hit on the hit the nail on the head, Jared, to be realistic in what we expect of them. Uh, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, and yep. that's an old adage, but true. Yep. Yep. Well, Jared, if, uh, have or, you got any, or if Chris, you... if I connect, if I could connect, yeah, I always want to connect for you. We talked to, we were going to start this whole thing about e-callers. Absolutely. And, and here's the connection guys, but here's the connection. When I've done, I've got the right pup with the right genetics. I've done my training with this young little guy that's, you know, his mind is not ready for an e collar, but I've taught him to come to me. I've taught him to walk on a loose leash. I've taught him to heal. I've taught him to get in the truck. And I've done these little things. And then we're going to start introducing the e collar. We're going to use that leather training tool on him for weeks and weeks and weeks. The e collar is going to be a communication tool to help the dog remember what we've already taught him. And if you use the leather collar and you use the e-collar to help remember, reinforce, or communicate what it is you're doing, all that e-collar is is a 300-foot rope instead of a 10-foot rope. Hmm. If you will do it that way, we'll eliminate all these issues of, oh, I had to fry him or I had to... My dog was spooked. A lot of dogs get spooked by the e-collar. It's not that they're afraid of it or hurt by it. They just never had that sensation on their neck. Well, if you use the leather training collar and you teach them to heal with the leather, you add the e-collar on top of it. So the e-collar is now just another level, another layer. I'm teach. I'm going to tug on this leather collar. I'm going to tug on his leash. And then I'm going to nick the collar on a, the lowest setting possible simultaneously. When I start doing those two together, all I'm doing is layering the e-collar on top of whatever the dog already knows. And then he's comfortable with it, and he's not spooked by it, he's not hurt by it. 
and we can build, let's do a whole other session and go from there. But the, 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 the bottom line is we're adding the e caller to reinforce or to communicate what's being taught. When you go from eight week old puppy to six month old dog and haven't done any work, and you throw an e collar on there and you try to shortcut it, all you're doing is you just have a recipe for disaster instead of a recipe for success. So our recipe for success today was genetics, time, puppy development, system, you know, expectations. And the recipe for disaster is got the right genetics. Uh, he's been sitting on the chain. He's six months old. Let's go to the field. And I don't know if he's started to come. I got this new gadget that shocks him when I push this button. And he's out in the field and I tell him to come. He doesn't even know what that means. And I start hitting buttons. You just yeah. got a recipe for disaster. Man. That's a perfect way to wrap it up and, and bring it all together. But Steve, I feel like we need to have Jared back on and uh, maybe move into the next level. We certainly went down the road or we thought we were going to make some short. I did because I laid out this show, but I thought we would do this whole shortcut thing and get right to e-collars. And then I realized during the conversation and Jared reminded us that there aren't any shortcuts. So, um, what do you say to that, Steve? You want to you want to have uh, Jared back, come back and and maybe go a little more in depth on e collar stuff? Without a doubt, we absolutely need to continue this conversation. And I think one visit won't be enough. One more visit won't be enough. I think we'll need to uh, impose on our friend. Uh, uh, as often as we can, because I think he, uh, you certainly have a wealth of knowledge on the subject, Jared. I like your approach very much, and uh, I know that what you're saying is true. I've applied some of these principles myself over the years, but I I'm, I say it all the time. I learn something every day, and I've learned a lot today from your conversation. So uh, the welcome mat's out, my friend, if you uh, are so willing to come back and share with our listeners. This has been very, very good. I would enjoy nothing more. I mean, this is my passion is, is helping people and creating that bond with their dogs. Well, the next time we visit, uh, Jared, I would like to um, explore, you know, how you apply these things uh, to this specialty uh, special needs uh, of the hound versus the bird dog. I know that there's probably some variances or differences that you've found in the way you train the hound puppies and so forth. And, uh, man, uh, we sure want to have you back. Yeah, that would be great. Yep. Steve, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and kick it back over to you and have you wrap this thing up and, uh, put a bow on it. <laughs> well, Christmas is coming, you know. That's right. And um, I, I think this podcast will uh, hopefully air before Christmas. And uh, <laughs> so I'll take that opportunity to wish you and Jared Merry Christmas and uh, uh, and and a Happy New Year and uh, all of our listeners the same. And uh, we it's amazing that we're uh, now in the 30-something in numbers of podcast that we've done when we started down this road we weren't sure uh, where it would lead us but uh, i'm finding that every adventure is more exciting than the one before and we certainly hope that uh, our listeners will will keep uh, hitting that subscribe button give us those five star reviews and help us keep this thing moving right along i think we've got it headed in the right direction and uh guests like uh jared moss certainly uh help that to to be true uh jared we have a saying here i guess it could apply to bird dogs uh, the same as hounds if you uh cut that brace of uh of uh gsps out there after chucker and uh one goes one way and one goes the other i just have to tell you my friend you follow your hound and i'll follow mine